I saw one of these weathermen on TV the other day, and he was pointing out that the cool down that's coming next week isn't going to be permanent. Well, I mean, it will get colder this time of year, and it will get much colder before the year's out. But we should mention that a little bit of cold shot next week doesn't mean that the rest of the month is going to be bitter cold. And it won't be bitter cold. We're looking at high temperatures. One of the forecasts I looked at today pegged the high temperatures for a couple of days next week in the mid-50s. You can live with that. Uh, And sometimes you'll see a competing forecast, which I saw last night. And the competing forecast says uh, actually in the low to mid-60s on those same days. Colder, though. I mean, and obviously we recognize that. If you've not yet kicked on the, the furnace, I keep reminding you, you better do it. And that's the way you'll find out. You can even do this in August when it's still hot out, just to find out if the furnace is is functioning properly. And if it's not, you need to call the good folks at Ramsey Heating and Electric. They'll come out, they'll do any repairs you need or any maintenance you need, and they'll get the job done right. They'll get it done right the first time that they're out there. Problem-free cozy winters found at Ramsey Heating and Electric, located at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley. The telephone number is 678-0459. That's Ramsey Heating and Electric, where they sell warm winters and cool summers. Just before the 9 o'clock news, I mentioned there's a letter today in the Times News. Uh, it's the lead letter. It's uh, from a writer who says, vote for Democrats uh, this uh, this November. And I'm paraphrasing here because Democrats will raise your taxes. I kid you not. It doesn't say that exactly in those words, but that's the argument in the letter. The writer says, well, if you vote for Democrats, we'll ensure you get better schools. How do Democrats claim they'll ensure you get better schools? They'll raise your taxes. They'll throw more money at the schools. The idea being that, well, we just, you know, we just need to keep spending more money. Uh, Paul Krugman, who's an economist and he writes a column for the New York Times, says that the reason that the stimulus package didn't work, well, there were two of them, when President Obama first put them out was because we didn't borrow or print up enough money to get it working. You know, the more money we print, you devalue your currency. That hurts people who've actually been saving. That hurts people who put money away for retirement. You know, if you, if you put a dollar away in 1996 and today that dollar is worth 43 cents, you get my drift. And if the government comes along and prints more money and then they make that dollar worth 33 cents, I think you understand what I'm talking about. Or you go borrow money from the Chinese who don't like us, or you borrow money, which we do in many cases from what are called sovereign wealth funds, which are controlled by Islamic republics. We owe those people. You understand? We owe them for all that borrowing. This is how it works in this country. Democrats keep saying, well, we'll solve the problem. We'll raise your taxes. Vote for us. <laughs> we'll take more of your money. We'll keep feeding the dead horse. This is from the Washington Examiner. School budgets, uh, school budgets expected to rise. Total spending on public schools increased 21% from 2000 until 2012 after adjusting for inflation. Funding is projected to rise by another 21% again following that last uh, 2012 school year through 24-25. These are huge increases. Teachers unions and liberals often blame low funding for lackluster improvements in education. Although school funding, uh, funding or spending has risen in the past decade, it's projected to rise even higher. Don't expect to see any major improvements in the nation's education results in the coming years. It hasn't happened yet, right? Why should you expect it? 61% of Americans would like more government funding for schools in their districts, but when the pollsters told people how much their schools already spend, that number dropped to 45%. So there you go. Meanwhile, in Nevada, court ruled yesterday, and school choice looks like it's going to continue. You see, here's the thing. The teachers' unions say, well, if you only give us more money... We'll make sure your kids know more, and then you give them more money. Then their unions take that money uh, that the teachers contribute, which they got in raised salaries, and they turn around and give it to Democrats who say, you know, if we only had more of your money to give to the teachers, who will in turn give to their union, which will in turn give to us, we'll make your kids smarter. That's a cycle. It goes round and round and round and round. But school choice... And the the court did not completely give a clean bill of health to Nevada, but they will be able to go ahead with their school choice law. And that means that in Nevada, parents will make the decisions on where their children go to school. And their children will then go to schools 
and, and, and force the public schools to become more competitive. Competition, folks, is what will drive a better education for young people. And if I had my druthers and I was doing it all over again, my daughter would have gone to a private school versus a public school. I just simply looking back on it now say it would have been much better for her. It's 939. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. I was at a presentation last night from some of our state legislators, and Stephen Hartkin mentioned that his opponent running against him for state representative has pledged that if you vote for her, she will raise your taxes. And uh, that way they will be able to give teachers more money, who in turn will give more money to the teachers union, who in turn will turn around and give it back to her for future campaigns. You understand. This is just a vicious circle, and if we don't stop it, we're going to bankrupt this country, and your children aren't getting any smarter. 20 minutes now away from 10 o'clock. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. Some closing thoughts for the week coming up in just a couple of minutes. It's 56. Thank you for joining us this morning. We should point out that we always have fun on Fridays. Looking forward to our busy weekends. Yeah, busy. Sitting in a chair watching football for 12 hours on Saturday. And only only seven or eight on Sundays. So Sundays are much better. Got a couple of quick notes here before we wrap up the program today uh, that I wanted to pass along to everybody. Number one, of course, if you're having some issues with your health and you're concerned perhaps that you're taking far too many drugs, that is, you know, the pharmaceutical industry would like to obviously sell you a lot more because that's how they make their money. But there was a time in history when people often found more traditional remedies. And a lot of those just happen to do with your overall health, how you're thinking, what you're eating, and the like. And we've been recommending now for several months that you have to get in contact with Dr. Eric F. Jones, who uses a holistic, systemic approach to wellness, and he's been doing this for nearly a quarter century. He has master's and doctoral degrees in marriage and family therapy. Dr. Eric F. Jones uses methods of alternative healing, and those would be nutrition, medicinal herbs, naturopathy, sound waves, intellectual, cognitive self-regulation, and apathy to help remedy and manage mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual challenges. He's currently accepting new patients. He has evening and Saturday appointments available. You can contact him by telephoning 731-7178 or go to his Facebook page, Eric F. Jones, Ph.D., Mental Health and Wellness Therapist. And I'd like to remind people that's Eric with a C. We were talking about how government earlier manages things in this country and they don't manage it well. And I was I was referencing education, but check this one out. I just saw this in the Wall Street Journal today. Did you know this? Well, let me share it. It says the Obama Clinton coal bailout. That's what it's the headline is. Well, what does that mean? This is from Review and Outlook in the journal. Democrats, the writer says, have a three stage strategy when they want to destroy an industry. Pick a politically vulnerable target, then pile on new regulatory costs. And finally, demand that taxpayers bail out the victims of the destruction. We're now in phase three in President Obama's war on coal. The Democrats are demanding that Congress save the United Mine Workers Pension Fund. So in other words, the coal industry was quite healthy. President Obama came along and said, coal, bad, bad, bad coal. No coal, get rid of coal. And along with his help from his friend Hillary Clinton, who said that she wanted to put the coal industry completely out of business, they did, for the most part, in this country. Now that means, of course, you've got unemployed coal miners all over the country, and the people who were funding the pensions, who were working there giving contributions, are no, they're no longer there to do it. Benefits are underfunded by $5.6 billion. That's billion with a B, or about $600,000 per worker. For you liberals out there, that's more than half a million. And the pension plan is projected to go broke by 2025. The union wants taxpayers to underwrite the pensions. Legislation popping up or propping up the union's pension fund has gained steam as both parties mine for votes in the Rust Belt. So Republicans are like, well, yeah, yeah, we'll go along with that because Republicans have managed to turn West Virginia red. That is, the coal miners in West Virginia and Kentucky and a lot of those strongholds that used to be United Mine Workers and close to Democrats. Remember, it was United Mine Workers who helped put John Kennedy into the White House back in 1960. We no longer have those types of Democrats in the good old USA anyway. But the Republicans have come along, and they're not looking like saviors for these people, but the Republicans are thinking, 
you know, if, if we don't bail them out, we, st- we won't get their votes after they've defected from the Democrats. That's how it seems to work in this country. 947, Bill Cowley with you on Top Story. There is an old thing called the Hegelian uh, dialectic, uh, named after a philosopher named Hegel, who essentially said, government comes along and creates a problem. Then government amplifies the problem. This would be like going into coal country and saying, coal is bad. So therefore, you amplify the problem by regulating coal to the point where it can't make it, and you strangle the industry. So he said government would come in, and these would be corrupt governments. These are not good governments. Government comes in, creates a problem, then it amplifies that problem, and then the government provides the solution. And the solution in this case would be a bailout for those people who were working in that industry. But none of this would ever happen if government didn't go in there and take a baseball back to the coal industry in the first place. Telephone number for reaching our program today, 736 736- 0300, 736 0300. They're killing off Wyoming, too. I mean, Wyoming was a big coal state. Montana was a big coal state. It's not just the old Appalachian region that they're after. They're, they're hammering away at people here in the Mountain West. Speaking of, uh, speaking of problems that will be coming forward for us, and, and uh, I've been tracking this the last several days, are you a reader of a, of a publication called Economy and Markets? Well, probably not. You've got so much to do in your lives. Those of us who get paid to do these things can have the liberties of looking at a lot of these uh, these publications. Economy and Markets, I've been reading now for the last couple of months. Uh, Harry Dent, the uh, famed economist, the man who's predicted a lot of the downturns we've experienced over the last 30 years, he's behind that publication, and, and they have been issuing some warnings. I mean, this is not just, you know, I mean, this is the Aruga horn going off. Aruga, Aruga. I mean, they are telling people right right now that we are in a critical situation. Uh, The market uh, dipped a little bit yesterday. That's on a one-day dip like that. You say, well, no big deal. But they are warning that far worse is that. First of all, you've got a, in this country, you've got a Federal Reserve that is simply propping up the phony economy to perpetuate Barack Obama and likely then Hillary Clinton. That's why we haven't seen an interest. If the economy is healthy, how come interest rates have been essentially zero for 10 years? See, ask, ask that question, answer that question. You understand what I'm talking about. And then you probably have heard, because, you know, you'll listen to some of these shows now and then. You can't help it. You're passing by and you hear somebody mention Deutsche Bank. That's the National Bank of Germany. Actually, it's been around a long time. If you go back and watch the old movie Casablanca, remember there's a scene where the uh, the, the, the fellow from Deutsche Bank gets thrown out of Rick's casino. Uh, he wants to get in the door to the back room so he can gamble in the back room and they won't allow him in there. And Don't you know who I am? He tries to pull that that stunt. Deutsche Bank's been around a long, long time. Deutsche Bank, when uh, when 9-11 happened, Deutsche Bank had a building nearby the Twin Towers in New York, and it was stuffed with gold. One of the first things they had to do was go in there and secure that site. So uh, there were fears that there were people behind this who might know that there was gold there. And, I mean, it was. we're not talking, you know, a few bars here and there in a corner. I mean, Deutsche Bank pretty much had its world supply of gold stuffed into the basement of that uh, that facility in lower Manhattan. So it's a big, big player in the world economy. It is also looking uh, at the moment like it's going to uh, sink. It, it, it's, a, it's a wounded duck, if you will. And we're not talking about the, uh, the Oregon ducks. Uh, they, they, they look pretty wounded recently. But I'm telling you right now, if Deutsche Bank goes down, That's a big boat, and big boats, when they go down, leave behind them big wakes. It will have ripple effects all over the planet. Can I add this as well? This comes from the Daily Signal. William T. Wilson, the writer, says China's economy is headed for a hard landing. The world's second largest economy is going to make a hard landing one day. China watchers have speculated for several years. The fact is, though, the Middle Kingdom already is well on its way. The first, well, he says he gives some numbers here. He says, Let's first examine the official top-line numbers. In 2007, a year before the great global crisis, China's real gross domestic product uh, product expanded at 14.2%. Now, we we would consider 3% growth to be good, steady, and healthy in this country, and we haven't seen that in 10 years. Imagine 14.2%. I don't even think the U.S. economy grew like that in any year 
following World War II, that period from 1945 to 1975, which was really the golden age of the United States of America. I don't think we ever had growth that could approach a figure like that. The writer says last year it grew only at 6.9%, so that's a 50% decline. The official GDP figures are increasingly suspect, however. China often releases its quarterly figures just two weeks after the end of the quarter. In other words, they've already figured out the numbers, and they release them before they actually see what they really are. So China may be lying about the growth. There may be no growth at all. China's aggregate debt, mostly corporate and government, is approximately 300% of the gross domestic product. Now, gross domestic product is the value of all goods and services produced in a country in one year. So when I say that, it's approximately 300% the debt of the gross domestic product, a figure that surpasses even that of the United States. Much of this debt is in short-term, uh, short-term instruments and is being used to roll over existing debt. In other words, they're using one credit card to pay off the other credit card. You've heard stories about families that get into that kind of trouble, and it's a bad, bad thing. Now, when you consider as well that out of the $20 trillion we have in this country, the national government has officially in debt, and I keep reminding people that's a figure that's, that's no one really knows what the number is. I mean, it's so vast, no one can really have a good handle on that. George Will wrote a column a few years ago where he speculated that if you count in all of the promises that have been made to government workers, retirees, and all the benefits that, are, that they're supposed to get and, and all of these things, and you count it from not just the national level, but you count it as well as the unfunded liabilities across the country that states have, local governments have, all of the promissory notes that have been issued, and the plans to pay for these things in the future. George Will wrote a column, and this was at least 10 years ago or pretty close to it, where he said then the national debt is likely $131 trillion. These are figures nobody in their right mind could ever imagine any country ever paying back. <laughs> just, it's, and somehow you keep thinking, yes, but I'm going to get my Social Security because I paid into it, dang it, and I'm going to take my army down to Washington and take it. Good luck in raising the army. Uh, Washington already has one of its own, and it's quite proficient. So you've got China, which is, is teetering on the brink of disaster. They have entire cities they built. Do you realize in like one three-year period, China used more concrete than the United States did in its entire history, building up this country? There are entire cities in China that were built on the speculation that they would be filled, and now those cities are empty. Enormous skyscrapers, great freeways, and they look like empty movie sets. There's an old episode of Star Trek where they go to find Jim Kirk's brother, who's living on some planet. They get down to the planet, and it's absolutely abandoned because these flying creatures have apparently killed everybody off. And they're walking around between all of these great big empty buildings and these empty streets. That's what these cities in China look like. So when China suddenly realizes it can no longer pay its bills, and it, it, it likely will devolve into warlordism. That is, it'll break up into many constituent parts, and perhaps they'll start taking all of their own nuclear weapons and lobbing them back and forth at each other. We're not, this is not a far fetched scenario. You know, these are people over in that part of the world who really don't have a lot of value on human life. You know, the North Koreans feel they could go out and blow up the world right now. And uh, the Politburo will just go hide out underground for 40 years, and then they'll come back out and start all over. Because they don't care for their own people, why would they care about anybody else's? And they're China's closest ally. Well, the Chinese are, are then going to come try to collect on the notes they're owed. You get that, right? The Chinese are owed a lot of money by, oh, us. Yeah, now you start to see where this is going. We've got about a minute to go. You're up next. You're on the air with Bill Colley on KLIX. All right, I'll try line two then. Hi, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, quickly, Bill, uh, the other day I seen a picture of Obama as the president of China, prime minister, whatever he is, and they were talking about how this Paris climate agreement is going to be, you know, in effect as fast as possible. And uh, this is what the truth is. China doesn't have any intentions of slowing down any of its, you know, fossil fuel use until 2030. Then it will start to uh, limit itself only a slight percentage. These are the kind of things that we get ourselves into with China, let alone the trade. 
Thanks, Bill. Thank you much for the telephone call. The notion that the Chinese, who have all of these internal problems and they have to feed 1.5 billion people, because otherwise those people get angry. The Chinese have even calculated they can only really take care of about 600 million people in their country. Uh, the rest are just going to be organ donors. If you think about that, though, the rest, those other 900 million, if they suddenly get hungry all at once, they got a nasty situation on their hand. And the thought that they're going to curb their emissions, the concrete production alone is one of the, the, the environment, let's say, one of the worst things you could, but they continue to do this. They say one thing, they do another. Why? Because if you're a, you're a Chinese leader, you realize you don't really want a rope around your neck. So when Barack Obama comes, you go, yeah, 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 whatever you need to do for the American media and all of your liberal campus friends, sure, 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 sure. And Barack says, well, you'll get it whatever you like from me as long as you get your picture taken with me and we pretend we're having a good time. Where's the red carpet, by the way? Oh, I don't get one? Well, that's okay. Can we get the picture now? God willing, if the creek don't rise, they'll allow me to come back and do this all over again between 8 and 10 o'clock on uh, Monday morning, right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. I hope you have a great weekend. Rush Limbaugh is going to be coming along next following the news from Fox at 10 o'clock. Sean Hannity at 1 o'clock today. Glenn Beck at 4. And Dave Ramsey tonight on KLIX.